joining us today. Um, the, uh, oh, there we are, there I am. Okay, uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for part one, um, the ACG Pittsburgh Virtual Wealth Management Series. Um, I'm, I'm Catherine Perry, a certified financial planner and financial advisor at Fort Pitt Capital Group. And I'm today, I am the ACG Pittsburgh FCL Chair. Um, FCL stands for Future Corporate Leaders Board uh, Chair. I will also serve as today's panel moderator and uh, contributor. Um, so first, I would like to thank ACG Pittsburgh's uh, annual sponsors. Uh, we would not be here without their generosity and uh, programs like this are only possible because of them. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor at the low, low price of $3,000, uh, please reach out to Micah Whitfield, who is Director of Business Development with ACG, uh, to learn about that. I also want to take a few moments before we get started to highlight one of our members uh, who was nominated for the ACG Pittsburgh Member Spotlight. An idea uh, that was started a few years ago by our future corporate leaders board. So once a month, we recognize one outstanding member by introducing them at events and featuring them on our website. Uh, this month's honoree is Adam Wicks, an associate, associate at Buchanan, Ingersoll & Rooney. Um, Adam works in the firm's corporate finance section in the Pittsburgh office. Um, his practice focuses on a wide range of corporate matters, advising clients ranging from startups to publicly traded companies on financings, corporate governance, mergers and acquisitions, uh, and federal and state securities law compliance. He works with clients on a variety of industries, including technology, manufacturing, security alarms, sports, and the nonprofit sector as well. Uh, Adam is incredibly active in ACG uh, events, as well as the Pittsburgh-based venture capital and private equity firms. He serves as chair of the Emerging Leadership Board of the Pittsburgh Venture Capital Association, um, in his personal life, Adam and his wife have a daughter, Stella, and a pit bull named Porter. Uh, so I would like to introduce Adam to say a few words uh, before we get our program started here today. Uh, thanks, Catherine, and thank you to uh, the FCL for this recognition. Um, I need to get a new professional headshot, I think. All of the hair has migrated from my top of my head down to my face since I had that picture taken. Um, but I just want to take a second to to thank and, and acknowledge Kelly and Ian and Jordan and Micah and the entire kind of ACG team, um, you know, really appreciate all of their efforts over the years. Um, and I think it's a direct contribution and, and, you know, reason why I've had the opportunity to meet and work with so many of you um, within the ACG ranks. Um, for those of you that I haven't met, um, I certainly look forward to meeting you, hopefully in person, as we start to get a little bit more back to normal, slowly but surely here. Um, and I would love an opportunity to do a deal together soon. So I uh, hope to see you all at, at our next event here. And, and thanks again. Thanks, Adam. And I told him I would uh, keep everything professional. So I'll keep my uh, smart remarks to myself. Um, as a joke, Adam and I are friends. So I, I told him I wouldn't give him a hard time on the webinar today. <laughs> Um, so I, congratulations and thank you again, Adam. Um, so our webcast today uh, our, for our topic uh, features Kim Kahi Forrest, um, who is the Chief Investment Officer and Founder at Boca Capital Partners, um, and Nick, uh, Nicole Fatak, who is a member at Clark Hill. Uh, so I'll let Kim introduce herself uh, for a moment. Sure. Oh, I keep... <laughs> oh, golly. Here we go. So once a computer scientist, always a computer scientist. Um, what I learned from that career, and that was my original career, is uh, if something doesn't work, just keep clicking the button. So that's what was happening on there. Anyhow, for the past 23 years, I've been involved in equities, and that means stocks to regular people. I started out uh, covering software at um, software companies at Parker Hunter, which is now Janie Montgomery. And uh, from there, I transitioned to Port Pitt Capital Group, where I became not just an analyst recommending stocks, but a portfolio manager actually managing stocks and started my own firm about two years ago. So I am very happy to be here. And uh, thanks for putting up with that little snafu. So Catherine, I think that's all for me right now. Sure. Uh, the perils of live television, right, Kim? <laughs> Um, so, Nicole, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. Um, as, as Catherine has so kindly said, and thank you, Catherine, for inviting me to participate today and to ACG. 
Um, I am a member at Clark Hill and I specialize strictly in estate planning, estate administration, and tax preparation um, for the last 15 years, um, not to age myself too much. Uh, so basically, you know, my goal is to make sure that every client comes in the door, understands their estate plan, why they're doing it, and what the documents say that they're walking out the door with. So um, I'm looking forward to talking a little bit about this topic today, and thank you again to ACG. Thank you, uh, Nicole and Kim. So just a, a quick item before we go ahead and jump into our program today. Um, if you have any questions for our presenters during the event, uh, please use the Zoom Q&A function. Uh, we will have that live throughout the entire program. So uh, if there is a timely question, our presenters will try and address it uh, at that time uh, throughout the program. And as always, if we are, are not able to address it during the program, we will uh, follow up afterwards. So let's, let's get started. Um, so we're all here today to talk about wealth management and, and what it is and, and why it's important. So uh, I live and breathe this all day long. Uh, but the, the main question uh, that I ask people is what do you want your life to look like now and in the future? So putting a financial plan in place can help outline this for you and help you guide you to financial success. It can also take a lot of uncertainty out of the, what we're going to call your accumulation years um, so that you can focus on your career, family, uh, and with the comfort of knowing that your finances are structured appropriately. So I'm going to go over some general structures uh, and ways, your, ways to set yourself up to achieve these goals. You know, the, the first thing that I always remind my clients of um, is to always have a healthy savings account. So before anything, you want to make sure you have a healthy savings account. Now, the industry standard rule of thumb uh, ranges uh, generally three to six months worth of your living expenses in a savings account, but that's very personal. I have some clients who want more than that in, in just cash and reserves. I have some clients who want less, uh, and then that's part of the fact that your plan is very personal to you and what you're comfortable with and what your goals are and what your long-term plan is. Uh, and so we have an industry standard rule of thumb, but that may not apply to you because your situation may be a little different, but at least gives you a starting point of where to, what, what to think about uh, with that. Um, above and beyond what is in your savings account, um, you know, in, in my opinion, is, is fair game um, and could be eligible to be invested. So um, some low-hanging fruit uh, that I have lots of conversations about um, are, are company-sponsored retirement plans, savings account, brokerage accounts, uh, and uh, what those, those really, really mean. Um, you know, I, I say if you have a company match with your company retirement plan, that's free money. Uh, my high, I would strongly recommend um, if it fits with your circumstances to at least participate in that if you have a, a company match. Um, now there, as I mentioned, savings accounts, regular brokerage accounts, which I'll address in just a moment. Uh, and then we have IRAs and Roth IRAs, which are pretty the most common uh, types of accounts that people have and that I get questions on. Um, and I, you know, those have the considerations for each. Um, they're what we call qualified dollars, which means they're, they're special tax considerations uh, or non-qualified dollars, which means they have different tax considerations. So. Uh, one other thing that I get lots of questions about and I think is an easiest way to just clean up your financial plan and, and, and kind of consolidate and get everything in the right in the right line um, is old 401k plans. So I, I, I forget the statistic now, but there's the statistic out there that folks will be changing jobs a, a number of times in their life at this point. It's no longer the day of working at one place for the rest of your career. Uh, so over time, there will be a variety of retirement accounts and 401k plans that are left hanging. Um, and a lot of times we forget about them, where they are, what the state, we don't anything about it. You know, the, the easiest way to um, help keep track of stuff is to consolidate it mo most of the time um, and to maintain your investment plan, your investment plan and your financial plan um, to make sure you know where everything is, everything's working in the right direction um, and it's all working and in, in, you know, swimming in the same direction for you. Um, the, the, the question I, I, I get a lot um, and, and this is not a bad problem to have, but is um, I have extra money and I got a bonus or I got a bonus and I don't know what to do with it. And my first comment is, well, that's a, not a bad problem to have. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the, the planning process comes in, comes in there, but that money um, could be eligible for to be invested in a regular brokerage account. You know, the nice thing about that is it's accessible before retirement. 
So there's no restrictions on what you can put in and what you can take out. There's tax considerations from capital gains, but uh, you know your that money is accessible at all times. For example, if you wanted to retire before the age of 59 and a half, which is the limit for taking money out of any qualified or any IRA or 401k type of account, um, there are penalties. Whereas in these kinds of accounts, a regular brokerage account, you can take money out at any time. So being able to fill this kind of account and, and get that invested and growing for you, um, you know, can only help you potentially be able to maybe retire early or, or draw from it before you want to retire. So, and I know I keep talking about retirement and for the, the age group of, of this conversation today, it can seem kind of far off, but you know, my job is to think long-term and think into the future and what your potential income stream would need to be. Um, and, you know, I have ways to calculate that and figure all of that out, but it's it's something to that you can set yourself up now for the future. Um, another question I get a lot is, uh, you know, how do I set myself my children up for financial stability as well? So there are a variety of accounts um, that you can uh, put money in for for college, uh, and then uh, you know for various investment accounts for them as well. But this could include college planning, um, having a will, which Nicole will address later, um, and then thinking about who would take charge and manage the inherited money if something happens to your, your children when they're still minors or even beyond. So um, those are a couple considerations when it, when it comes to that. Um, one of the other things, which as life goes on, we need to start considering our parents and their situations and to make sure that you're not, um, it's not more of a fire drill um, should something happen to them. Um, so that is also something that people don't necessarily think about when you're dealing with your own financial plan. But if their parents are going to start needing care uh, or anything like that, that's also a consideration that could affect your personal finances as well. So I'm going to just run through some quick numbers here because I know we're all numbers people um, on the general power of investing. Um, so just try and try and follow follow this here. So an example. So Chloe um, invested from ages 25 to 65. So her entire working career, she put $400,000 away total at a six and a half percent rate of return, which is a reasonable, mar reasonable market return over the long term. At age 65, she has about $1.8 million invested uh, in, in the market, was, was regimented, was putting money away on a timely fashion, um, and had her plan put together. So she has $1.8 million when she wants to retire. That's fantastic. Uh, another example, Noah um, saves money in his savings account um, from 25 to 65, puts the same amount of money away. Um, the, 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 uh, the statistics that I got actually use a 2.25% rate of return on savings accounts, which we all know at this time is actually quite generous. <laughs> um, so, but for, for this example, this proves my point. Um, at 65, he will have about $652,000. So to recap, Chloe could have same, same span of saving uh, slash investing, same amount of money. Um, she could have $1.8 million. He could have $652,000. That's a big difference when you go to retire. Um, and then even the, the effect of delaying retire, delaying putting your plan together and saying, oh, I'll deal with that later. I will handle um, college for the kids first, uh, and then I'll, I'll handle my retirement. That can also cost a lot of time in the market. Uh, and time in the market is what is important, not you know, saying I'll do that later. Because an example that I can use the same uh, general concept, uh, Lila invested $300,000 between age 35 and 65. So she started a little later. Uh, same rate of return, 6.5%. At 65, she has about a $919,000. So delaying just for 10 years or for this example could cause almost a million dollar effect on your overall savings. Um, and that's why I, I am encouraging and stressing the idea of prioritizing ourselves um, because we can't get that time back. And I know that we all work on our clients' accounts and our clients' money, and uh, we all know everything ins and outs of all of our clients. Uh, and I encourage uh, everyone on this call, and, and then some, to still take a moment to worry about your own your yourself um, and what's happening with you personally. Once you get it set up, it's not something that needs to be changed all the time. 
but as a as someone who has seen the effects of all of the different ways you can approach this, my encouragement would be to, to get started sooner, um, as, as soon as possible, and make yourself a priority as well. Um, now, the, the term investing as a general concept can lead down a, a black hole of uh, how to, what to pick, how do I do this, what do I do that. Kim's going to address that later uh, about the importance of the allocation and actually knowing what you're invested in. But my, my worst case thought here is if, if that's if what, what Kim is going to present later still seems a little bit um, far fetched and too intimidating. My recommendation is to work with a professional. You know, we're all here to be that person for our clients. Um, and then you also should think about that for yourself. You know, you, you're, you encourage your clients for, to work with a professional for help for things that they don't know and need help with. You should also consider the same. No one expects you to know everything. Um, and see, seeking advice is perfectly normal. Um, you know, I always say there's a reason why really smart, wealthy people have other people managing their money um, because they don't have the time, the energy, or knowledge to do it themselves. Um, and, you know, trusting a professional is incredibly important, uh, especially when you're planning your financial future for yourself and your family. Um, so let's take it back to our overall plan. It can often get overlooked about just even simply writing out a plan um, about what you want everything to look like, what the long-term, short-term goals are. Um, but it's something that I, I find is incredibly important to help um, folks really pinpoint what they want and young families and, and new, new couples, I've found, uh, to make sure they're on the same page as well. So something that can often get overlooked as you're building your wealth um, is you think, what happens to my wealth and my plan um, that I've put in place if something happens to me? You know, what happens to my family? Um, you know, and segue into Nicole, uh, you know, estate and investment planning goes hand in hand uh, because as you think ahead for your financial future, your estate and the wishes for everything that you've worked for are part of that. And there are some pitfalls and there are some things to consider that go hand in hand with not just picking your investments and your savings and, and in your investments, um, but then also making sure legally everything is structured the way you want it to be. So um, at this moment, I'm gonna pass it off to Nicole um, to tell us a little bit about um, you know, why estate planning is also a vital part of wealth management. Thanks, Catherine. Um, thank you again for having me to speak today. And I have to say, it's a little weird not to be able to see. We're talking ahead of time, your faces, because I'm used to kind of getting some questions and making this interactive and seeing when my jokes bomb. So if anybody does have any questions as we're talking, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll make sure I answer them directly. So Catherine alluded a little bit to this, but I think the biggest thing to talk about first is why is estate plan important? Um, a lot of people think, well, I don't have a lot of money or everything's going to my spouse. So why spend the money to go through this process with a professional? And there's a couple things. One is to protect assets for your family, right? I think the most important thing is to make sure assets are going where you want them to go upon death. Um, a lot of people assume, oh, everything's just going to go to my spouse or it'll go to my kids. And that's not always the case. So we're going to go through a couple of those different scenarios. It also helps you preserve the value of your assets. Um, Pennsylvania has an inheritance tax. Um, there's a federal estate tax we'll talk about. So it helps get the most value of your assets to the next generation. And a lot of what we do is also tax planning, you know, to avoid those taxes, if at all possible. Um, the estate tax exemption is very high right now, but it may not be that case um, when you pass away, you know, 30, 40, 50 years from now. Um, the other um, thing that's very important is that it isn't just for the super wealthy that I mentioned. You know, I, I remember, you know, even now starting out and being like, yeah, we don't have anything. I have a 401k and I put my husband on that and everything's fine. But particularly for young professionals, if you have children, it is very important that if something happens to you, you name a guardian for your minor child in your estate. That is something that you want to decide and you never want the court to decide who has the care of your children. Um, also, if you leave money to your kids and you don't have a will, they get that money at age 18. Here you go, here's a check, good luck, God bless. 
And if you can recall back to your personality and your financial savvy at age 18, that's not always the best choice. Um, uh, it's hard to have, give a child a check and then say, don't spend it. Right. Um, so to prevent that child from, you know, going off to Vegas, buying the Maserati or saying, hey, guess what? Now I don't have to go to college because I have $50,000. Wills in the state plane are very important. So there are a couple areas of estate planning I wanted to mention briefly today. I'm going to try to stick to the basics. And like I said, if you have follow up questions, you know, please let me know. The first documents I wanted to talk about are the lifetime documents. Um, those are if you become incapacitated and can't make decisions for yourself during your lifetime, who makes them for you? So the healthcare power attorney appoints an agent to make healthcare decisions for you if you are incapacitated and not able to make those decisions for yourself. If you do not have a healthcare power of attorney, there is a statute under Pennsylvania law that steps in and says who that would be. Um, if you're married, it's your spouse, which may be your logical first choice anyway. Um, if not your spouse, it goes to children over age 18. And if you're not married, it goes to your parents and then down to your siblings. So there may be somebody in that bloodline that you think, gosh, I never want my brother Joe to make a healthcare decision for me. Well, by exercising the power of attorney and having that document in place, you get to decide who that is. Um, also, a lot of times clients come in and they say, oh, well, my daughter is 18, it's fine, you know, she can do it. And I always say, well, this would mean that her parents does not have, you know, it's in a major healthcare crisis and doesn't have capacity. Is that something you really wanna put on an 18 year old, right? I know I personally don't wanna make that decision now for my parents, let alone back at 18. So it's something to think about um, and who you want those roles, you know, who do you want to make those decisions? The other document that deals with healthcare is what we call a living will. Um, that is your decisions if you are in an end stage terminal condition. So that is the proverbial, you're not coming back to us. Um, you do not have capacity. You're not expected to regain capacity. What do you want to happen? Um, do you want to be kept alive artificially? Do you want CPR at that point? Um, a lot of people tell me, hey, I, if my brain's gone, I just wanna go, or I don't wanna be in a coma for years and my family have to deal with that. This is your chance to make those decisions yourself. And this document's really not for you. It's really for the person making the decisions. So they don't have to feel guilty and wonder, well, I have no idea what Susie wanted and I don't know what to do. So it really takes some of the burden off the person that you're appointed as your healthcare agent if that was indeed the circumstance. The last of the lifetime documents, I think is the most important document you will sign for estate planning. If you sign one document, it should be your financial power of attorney. The financial power of attorney appoints an individual to act on your behalf in regard to finances and financial decisions if you're incapacitated, if you're traveling abroad, if you're laid up in the hospital, um, or just can't get to that closing. So it really comes in at any time. But a lot of people assume that, hey, you know, if something happens to me, my, my spouse can just take, step in and take care of all of that. And that's not the case. Uh, if you have assets in your individual name, any assets at all, nobody can automatically step in and do those for you. Nobody can automatically step in and pay your bills or call the insurance company. They will be required to go to the court in your county and be appointed as guardian of your estate which takes time, takes money, they have to prove you're incapacitated. Um, it's really a process that I do not like to see clients go through, particularly as a spouse or a parent or somebody who logically should be able to make those decisions for you and assist. So if you sign one thing <laughs> in the estate planning world, you know, please let it be your financial power of attorney and appoint someone to make financial decisions on your behalf if you're not able to. Um, I do get the question, you know, because this is a live document, right? I mentioned you don't have to be incapacitated for someone to use it. So I do get the question, well, if I appoint my spouse, does that mean they can run off to the Cayman Islands and get remarried and, and basically wipe me out? I will tell you there's a lot of legal repercussions to that and I have never seen it happen in 15 years. But like I said, there are protections we can put into place where you sign a letter of authorization and say your attorney keeps the document. We only release it on proof you're incapacitated or if you tell me to. 
So don't be nervous about signing that document, you know, talk to your attorney about that and there are precautions we can put into place. So those are the lifetime documents. All the powers those agents have cease at the moment of death. And that's where your traditional death planning comes into play and your last will and testament. So as I mentioned before, the assumption is that if you're married, especially, everything's just gonna go to my spouse. And that may be correct. Um, if you have assets titled jointly, so if you have both names on your home or a joint checking account, anything held jointly with another individual passes to the survivor by operation of law. So if your house is owned, you know, I own mine with my husband, if something happens to me, it automatically goes to him. But if you have any assets in your sole name at all, um, I know my husband has his slush account that he claims is there to buy me gifts with. I don't really know what's in it, and but I do get some good gifts, so it's okay. Um, that doesn't automatically go to me if something passes away. So if you're a Pennsylvania resident, Pursuant to Pennsylvania statute, I'm going to go over a couple of the scenarios because I think they're going to surprise you, likely. If you are single, so you have, um, and basically everything goes pursuant to the intestate laws of the state of Pennsylvania, and that is your bloodline. So if you are not married, it goes automatically to any children. If you do not have children, it goes to your parents. If you don't have parents, it goes to your brothers and sisters. Um, but a lot of times, you know, clients come in and say, my parents don't need this money. And frankly, it's going to go to them and be taxed and then come back down the line and be taxed again. So a lot of times parents don't make sense. Um, children under 18 can't inherit. And we're going to talk a little bit about some options for that. But if you are married and you have no surviving children or a parent, your spouse receives your entire estate. Okay. If you have no surviving children when you're married. So you're married, no children, but you do have a parent that survives. So you have a surviving spouse and a parent. Your spouse does not get your entire estate. The spouse receives the first $30,000 and then they get one half of everything else. So their, your parents would get one half of everything else. And I will tell you, a lot of people are not thrilled when they find out their in-laws are getting 50% of their assets, right? So something definitely to think about in that scenario. If you have um, blended marriages and blended families are very popular, you know, that's what's going on these days. You know, people are on their second, third marriage, they have kids from multiple marriages and that's the new normal. And, you know, people, families make up all different types of individuals and they're very complex. And if you have children who are not also children of your surviving spouse, everything doesn't go to the spouse. The spouse gets 50% and your children get 50%. Okay, some people like that's good, some people not so good. Um, if you also have, the same works if you have kids who are yours um, and your spouses. So, you know, my husband and I have two girls. If something happens to me and I don't have a will, my husband doesn't get everything. He gets the first $30,000 and then my kids get half and he gets half. So those laws in Pennsylvania completely get rid of the theory that everything goes to your spouse. And um, particularly in the case where there's no surviving children but a parent, many people don't realize their parents will inherit 50% of their estate and their spouse the other 50%. So those are a couple of reasons why it's very important that you outline in your will where you want things to go at time of death. The other thing that a will does is it names your executor. An executor is basically your administrator in your will. It tells you um, the person is basically kind of a detective. They figure out what assets you had, what bills are left to be paid, any debts that are paid, um, medical expenses, all those sorts of things. And they typically work with an attorney to make sure everything's paid and everything is fine. They file your final income tax returns, file your death tax returns, and they make sure that the beneficiaries get what they're entitled to. So a lot of times that's your spouse in the first case, but the question is if you know your spouse couldn't serve, say you're both in a car accident and something happens, who steps in and does that? Um, like I said, if not, you know you have to go to court and have somebody appointed in that role. So that's very important to do. The other thing I mentioned and alluded to that I wanted to make sure we talked about is inheritances for children. So if you don't have a will in place, 
and a share goes to a minor child um, in Pennsylvania that's 18 years of age and under, then basically they have to go to court and have a guardian appointed of that child's asset to hold that asset until they turn 18. That guardian typically cannot be the surviving parent. Courts do not like, at least in Allegheny County and surrounding counties, to appoint a parent in that role because of the fact that they are concerned the parent will not spend the money on the kids but on themselves. So anytime children are involved, courts are very, very cautious about who holds those funds. So they likely will have to appoint a co-guardian with the parents or a financial institution to do that. And that lasts until they're age 18. The money is there if they need it for healthcare, college expenses, those sorts of things. But at age 18, whatever's in there, they get a check, period. Whether it's $10,000 or a million dollars, it's theirs and they can walk away and do whatever they want with. That is not um, the best scenario for a lot of parents. <laughs> Most parents are like, uh, yeah, no way, not happening. So in your will, we can create trust for your children. And those trusts do two things. One, if your child is under 18, it provides a place for those funds to go. Especially, you know, basically goes through and says the same thing. It's there for whatever you want to make it there for, their support, their health, their education, their maintenance, weddings, um, starting a business. But you specify those terms. Okay? So there is no court proceeding to have a trust or a guardianship set up for your minor child. The other nice thing is you control when they get the money. It doesn't have to be at age 18. If it's not much, you could say yeah, 25, maybe when they're through college, they can have some. And really, as time has gone on, 99% of my clients just put their money in trust for the kids, and that's that. There is no mandatory age where they get a check. Um, a lot of times, you know, clients come in, their kids are one, two years old, and you have no clue what they're going to be like at age 20, 25, 30. So we leave it in trust for their benefit. And, you know, assuming all goes according to plan, we can change that as time goes on and the kids get older. The other thing that people like is that so long as assets are held in trust for a child, there are certain protections that they get that they don't get otherwise. So I feel like um, trust get like the kind of a Hollywood rap of the verbiage of the word. I don't trust somebody with my money. That's what you see in the movies and whatnot. And that's not really why we create trusts. I have clients whose kids are in their 60s and are retired and had a fruitful career and a family and they still leave their assets and trusts for them. And that is because of these protections. So when you create a trust for somebody else, those assets are one, creditor protected. So if they make a bad financial decision and have to declare bankruptcy, they can't touch their inheritance. Um, they get in a car accident and somebody sues them. They can't touch their inheritance. The second protection which parents love is that it is divorce protected. So if your child were to get married and it doesn't work out and get divorced, their ex-spouse doesn't walk away with half their inheritance. So for clients, especially with a little bit of wealth, it acts almost as an automatic prenup, which avoids that whole awkward conversation when your child says they want to get married. So that's a really big plus. The third is that it is exempt from death taxes when you pass it to the next generation. So say, you know, your child gets a million dollars from a life insurance policy and there's a million dollars in that trust and they don't need it. You know, you live a long, happy life. They get this later in life and they say, I want to leave this to my grandchildren. They can do that and pass those trust assets down the line without any additional death taxes, regardless of how much those assets grow. So it's basically growing wealth in somebody else's pocket, death tax, right? And to give you your 10 second death tax lesson for today, um, Pennsylvania does have inheritance tax. It is strictly because you are a resident of Pennsylvania, starts at dollar one, but their rates are quite low. It's zero percent to spouses. So typically on the first spouse's death, we don't pay any inheritance tax. It's only four and a half percent to children and grandchildren. So the four and a half percent, um, it's kind of like a windfall tax. There's really no planning around it. If you want to leave things to your siblings, the rate is 12%. And to anybody else under the sun, it's 15%. So also, um, as far as charities go, those would be 0% as well. 
There's also a federal estate tax, and that's been the one that's been in the news lately as part of the um, proposal that's in front of Congress. There, that, there's a lot of talk about lowering that exemption amount. Right now, you can pass 11.47 million without paying a dime of federal estate tax. So it does not apply to a lot of people. There was some talk that would go down to closer to 6 million. Those provisions have been removed from the current proposal. So it looks like it's going to stay the same, at least for next year and be indexed for inflation um, up to about, I believe it's $12.08 million. So most people aren't subject to that tax right now. So if you hear that stuff in the news or on CNN or MSNBC, it's not something to be concerned about right now. Um, but you know, it, when I started, it was a million dollars. And people come in and say, I don't have a million dollars. And I'd be like, well, what about life insurance? What about your pension? What about your 401k? And you get to that number a lot faster than you think. So I'm sure the goal of everyone here <laughs> financially, um, as Catherine talked about, is to someday be in those sort of tax brackets. But um, you know, this presentation is geared towards the younger crowd. And frankly, this law is going to change 40, 50 times probably by the time you pass away. So uh, if you are subject to that tax for any reason, you know, reach out to your attorney and, and you know, do some special estate planning to reduce that. Um, as far as your wills, the, the, like I said, the, one of the most important things is if you have a minor child, making sure you appoint a guardian of his or her estate. That is the person that has physical custody of your child so long as they are under 18 years of age. I always like to name a backup, frankly, too, in my document because I never want to let the court make those decisions um, at all. That may or may not be the same person that's serving as trustee for your child. We talked about those trusts you create for your children. You have control over who you appoint as trustee. It could be, and remember these trusts aren't formed unless you and your spouse are both gone. So it may be another family member, it may be a friend, it may be a financial institution, that choice is entirely up to you. Some people like it to be the same person or frankly don't have anybody else they trust in that role. Some people like a little separation of church and state. You know, they don't necessarily want the money to be involved with the same person as physical custody. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention about your will is what I call the disaster clause. Um, that's not a legal term, that's my term, but that is, you know, your spouse and the kids are on the plane, the plane goes down, right? Very unlikely to occur, but what happens to your money? Um, where do you want it to go? Especially if you have young children or you're single or, you know, you're just newly married. The statute tells you where it's going to go and it's going to be your bloodline and you may not want to give you know like i said brother joey a million dollars or your parents may not need it or you might want to leave some money to charity at that point so this is your opportunity to specify where you want things to go under those unlikely circumstances and the last thing i wanted to mention really quickly is retirement accounts and life insurance policies so as young professionals the bulk of your wealth is in money you can't access right now. It's in that life insurance policy that pays out on death or in your 401k, your IRA, your pension. Those type of accounts pass pursuant to the beneficiary designation on file with the company, period. They do not pass pursuant to your will and they basically will pass where the company tells you they pass if you do not fill out that form. So I have clients, um, I had a situation the other day where 25 years old, you start your first job, you fill out that paper, you put mom and dad on it, right? Because you don't have anybody else. Well, he got married, had three kids, and he never changed that form. And guess what? It's going to mom and dad. Or people have additional kids and never change that form. So as part of the estate planning process, it's very, very, very important that you talk to your financial advisor. You get copies of those forms from the company you work for, and you make sure they match what you want to happen. Um, one thing we adjust a lot of times for clients is that they name their kids as contingent beneficiaries. Well, remember what I said about the fact that if they're under 18, they can't inherit those funds. So the life insurance company would make somebody go to court once again and have a guardianship set up to receive those funds. By changing the beneficiary from the kids to the trust you created for them under your will, you eliminate that whole problem. And you can basically designate the kids trust as beneficiary of anything. So, you know, please, if you take nothing else away from today, you know, check on those with your company, your financial advisor, and make sure those are up to date based on your current life circumstances. Um, so that's kind of, you know, the basic estate planning in a nutshell.
Um, there's all kinds of more advanced planning you can do, but I, we're not going to get into that today. So if you have any questions about anything, you know, please feel free to ask. So Catherine, I'm going to shoot it back to you. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, one of the things I, I also will highlight regarding uh, beneficiary designation forms that Nicole mentioned, um, if you, uh, we've come across this a couple of times uh, with multiple marriages. Um, if you get remarried, uh, you want a big one. <laughs> yep. Uh, we've come across those uh, once or twice where, unfortunately, the previous spouse was the named beneficiary and it wasn't updated when the, the when that marriage ended and, and um, the client got remarried. So that's a tough conversation that your ex-spouse yeah. will be inheriting all your money. Um, probably I had the situation fun. once where it was a legal separation. They hadn't lived in the same house for three or four years and... The, the man unfortunately passed away very unexpectedly very young and he never changed the designation form from his separated wife mm -hmm. and because they weren't to a certain point in the divorce proceeding some certain paper hadn't been filed she walked away with all the money yeah so you're absolutely right yeah so that's just other things to keep in mind um so you know thank you nicole um, absolutely so thank you so we, we've talked about you know i've talked about why you should have a plan and why you should invest uh, Nicole has talked about um, the often overlooked part of the estate plan and the, the legal part that goes along with your plan and your investments and why you should set yourself up for financial success. Um, so now Kim uh, is going to come in and talk about investing itself. You know, what, is, what does that mean when we say investing? Um, so Kim, take it from here. Thanks. Yeah, and it's great to follow up after, you know, this is so logical, right? We've figured out we need to plan before we start moving in any direction. And then we have to have a plan just in case things don't quite go the way we want. Or, you know, maybe the way we want at the end of our life that those assets get protected. So let's talk about assets right now. I am so happy to be talking to you guys because of any of the people that I talk to, I'm sure you guys at least have passing knowledge, if not intimate relationship with the idea of cash flows, right? You are all in business um, and whatever kind of um, place you serve in a business, you've seen cash flows. So it, it's very minimum. Investing is about picking vehicles that will give you cash flow and then return on that cash flow, right? So let's talk about stocks. What you're basically doing is you are buying a piece of a company you evaluate that company and whether or not you should buy it based on the, its likelihood of its cash flows increasing. And, um, you know, that's, that's pretty much it. So there's three big areas that I'd like to talk to you about or that kind of go in that cash flow area, stocks, bonds, and then cash, right? So that's the very basic building blocks. Um, my industry loves terms, right? And the more kind of terms that you can use that other people may or may not understand, the smarter you look, or so it seems, right? So all a mutual fund is, and this is very basic and we're gonna go a little bit faster here, but mutual funds are a collection of either stocks or bonds, or maybe real estate investment trusts or some other kind of cash flow sort of vehicles. And ETFs are pretty much cash flows that um, are cheaper and can be traded throughout the day because we now have computers. Um, mutual funds used to only trade, or they only trade once a day at the end of the day. And that is because we didn't have computers to be able to figure out what that collection of either stocks or bonds was at, at any time of the day. But ETFs have kind of taken that place. So I hope I'm uh, letting the, uh, scales fall from some of your eyes out there about uh, it's all really based off of is it stocks bonds or cash in that mutual fund or etf getting a little bit more exotic and generally for wealthier people you can have commingled assets and what that is it's kind of like a uh, very special uh, mutual fund but it has things in it like venture capital investments or private equity investments and these are um, parts of businesses or whole businesses themselves that 
people that unless they have enough financial wherewithal and demonstrate that they're pretty darn rich, that they can participate in these um, funds, right? Private equity funds, venture capital funds, and hedge funds. So those are loosely termed as alternatives. So, and then we finally have things that don't necessarily have cash flows um, associated with them, but they really are kind of a balloon payment where you buy it on day one, you sell it on day X, and that's a balloon payment. So that would be things like commodities, gold and silver, um, art, and maybe even crypto, which I am sure I'm going to get a question on crypto, but it is something that has no cash flow and you're just buying it based on what you think you could get whenever you're going to sell it, right? So we have all these um, vehicles that we can buy. Um, and then the uh, investing uh, uh, population comes along and says, hey, I'm going to make something even better, but I'm going to charge you a whole bunch of fees. And that would be a structured product. So my advice to you is to stay away from structured products because they make the people selling them rich. So let's just put that on the table. What you should be doing is working with your advisor to figure out what your risk reward um, ratio is. How much risk can you take and how much reward are you going to get? Um, and is that in line with what the rest of your financial uh, wherewithal can handle? So that is another valuable item that a financial advisor like um, uh, Catherine can give you is figuring that out. Because when the market's going up, everybody thinks their risk reward is very tilted towards reward, not risk. Um, but finding that right mix is incredibly, incredibly important. Um, at the end of the day, any investment that you're making and that you're going to use sometime in the future, whether that's through your retirement for to fund an activity like college or to um, you know just get richer, it really is about making sure that you have the purchasing power for those dollars in the future. In the past probably 15 years, I've talked about inflation and it hasn't existed, but now that we have inflation, I think you can probably see that maintaining pricing power in your dollar is really important because we can have times like this where inflation is running away and you can see how maybe saving a dollar in a um, lower risk, lower reward sort of vehicle like a bond or God forbid, straight up cash, right? How that is not gonna allow you to have the lifestyle that you want if inflation in fact continues, right? So that is making investing all the more pertinent right now. What you should also do is work with your investor to make sure that the your whole investing um, scenario, whether that's taxable um, uh, accounts and then non-taxable accounts like 401k, that they are working together and they don't have too much overlap. You don't want to wake up one day and discover, oh, I don't know, you have a whole lot of um, a company like GE, which was a really good company at one point, and then it falls off uh, out of favor due to self-inflicted wounds or whatever, maybe, you know, somebody else comes up with a better product. And you, so you don't want to have a huge amount of any uh, one company exposure. So uh, that is always something to think about. Um, and I'm really blasting through this because what people like me do are put portfolios together to try to match what the advisor and the um, investor need to have happen. So we can use the magic of math to be able to put together portfolios that empower you with respect to risk and reward. But, um, you know, I can't really talk about that individually here because, well, you know, we're on a Zoom call. So I'm trying to just give you the 50,000 foot view of investing. But anyhow, something that you really can control are fees. Make sure you understand in each investment that you go into, what the fees are. Because fees are important. I think professionals should get paid what they're worth. 
but sometimes there are hidden fees like in mutual funds where you're not necessarily having those fees deducted where you can see, but they are disclosed. So always, always, always look in that fine print for fees. If there is one thing that I could give you today, other than that risk reward thing, it is make sure that the fees are in line with the services that you get and don't eat far too much into your um, you know, core investment. So um, I'm trying to hurry along because it's 1250 right now. I hope there will be some questions out there and I hope I gave you a 50,000 foot view of the investing landscape and how to approach it with an advisor. Catherine? Thank you, Kim. Um, I appreciate your, your, uh, your insight there. Um, you know, and this all goes back to the overall wealth management picture and, and when you are putting your plan together, how many partners you, you need to have uh, in this whole in this whole process. And it can seem overwhelming, uh, but I, I go back to the group that I know is on the call today. Um, and again, we all help our clients and we have a team to help our clients. Um, and you should uh, be able to participate in the same concept. You know, you, there's a team to help you. There's a team to help uh, you be successful uh, with, with your financial life. So, you know, I, I appreciate Nicole and Kim uh, providing some insight on uh, the various aspects of wealth management because uh, again that can kind of be a black hole um and you know financial planning estate planning and and specifically the investment so thank you guys um so we did get a couple of questions um and if you do have questions and you didn't add them ask them during the presentation please feel free to um drop them in the chat box now um so I do have a, a couple of questions here let me I've been compiling them on my other screen here um, so, uh, one question I got was, how do I know if I'm doing enough? Um, so I have a savings account and a 401k, uh, but how do I know what, what, what is enough? Um, I always joke with my clients when they say, well, um, you know, I, I think I want to put more away. How much should I do? And I say, well, how much can you, how much can you do? Um, I'm never going to say no <laughs> to saving and investing. Um, so when, if, if you're, you're not sure if you're doing enough, um, you know, there's a there's a joke that if it, if it doesn't hurt uh, from a financial standpoint, then you aren't doing enough. But uh, in all seriousness, you know, th this is, again, why at least talking to someone or there's lots of online calculators to help you figure that out, too, if you'd rather do it um, on, online yourself, um, to help you figure out at your current rate what you're doing, how at, at re you know, whatever return rate you'd like to select in there. Just don't select 20% like we've been seeing in the market in the past couple of years because that's not realistic long term. Um, but you know, at the reasonable rate, what that would look like at retirement, uh, or, or what that would look like in a few years. You know, maybe your your goal isn't retirement. Maybe your 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 first stop on the train is you want to buy a house, or, the, or um, you want to buy another house. You know, a bigger house, your forever home, uh, or it's college, or it's uh, a, a lake house. Uh, there's ways to figure out if you're on track. You know, and again, working with someone like me, I can do the math and help you figure out if, if that is enough or it is not. Um, but the general industry standard, like I always said, rule of thumb type thing, is 10% of your income is what you should be putting away. Uh, so fully understanding that may not happen overnight, uh, but building your three to six months of savings, uh, again, doesn't happen overnight either. Um, but trying to push for at least 10% of your income doesn't happen overnight as well. Most of the time, but that's a thing to strive for. If you can do more than 10%, I'm never going to say no. Uh, it's one of those things client says, I have extra money. What do I do with it? Well, I will find a place for that. Um, so, you know, it's if it's not something you need in the near term, you know, get, get it invested uh, for you for the, for the long term. Um, Kim, I think this is a question for you. Um, so... It may be a little bit specific, but you can try and try and answer it. Um, regarding bonds at certain ages in portfolios, do you want to touch upon that? I do. And I'm going to go against the grain of what a lot of people think. So there was this old rule, I don't know, maybe started back in the 1950s or something like that, 
that somehow it was your age minus 60. Is that right, Catherine? Yeah, okay. Your age minus 60 would give you the proportion of bonds to equities that you needed in your um, portfolio. Well, here's the thing. What if you're 80? You have some kind of defined benefit plan. And I guess you'd have to be 80 to do this, right? Because like nobody has pensions, like that classic pension anymore. But it takes care of more than enough of your spending cash. Why would you ever have a ton of bonds? It's foolish. The money that you have saved your entire life is now sitting there rotting away in these bonds and kind of doing okay in this 60-40 kind of split or maybe even worse, like 80-20 kind of split. And you have to look at what your personal cash flow needs are and then adjust that percentage accordingly. And I would say if anybody is under the age of what would we say, Catherine, like 40 on this call, they should have zero in bonds right now, especially because bonds just aren't returning any money. And unless you have some kind of defined cash flow issue that you really need this money to be spinning off other money, then you'd think about that. But uh, even then, I don't know. If you're young, please don't have bonds, please. How's that, Catherine? Is Perfect. that an advertisement? That was, I mean, it, it, it's, it's true. Um, and I have that conversation often. So thank you. Okay. Um, so one more quickly, um, I think that I'll answer this one because I think this one um, will, will work um, for, for now. There are a few more questions, but we only have time for one more. So um, how do I know when I can afford to retire? Uh, I get that question all the time. People say, well, when can I retire? Um, and then I kind of kick the question back and say, well, how much do you need to live on in retirement? Uh, how much are we saving? What, you know, and so on and so forth. Back to Kim's point of cash flow needs. Um, you know, if you don't need cash flow from your portfolio and you can live on just dividends or something like that, then you can retire now if you want. Um, you know, it's it's very much a personal uh, personal conversation. And so again, it goes back to having a plan and working with um, an advisor to help you with, um, you know, Put all that together. Uh, so with that, um, I will wrap everything up for the sake of time. I, I do want to be considerate of everyone's time this afternoon um, on their lunch break. Um, and I know Kim and Nicole probably want to eat lunch too at some point. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, thank you uh, very much uh, for uh, your, your time uh, on our panel today. You know, I, I hope everyone in the audience uh, got a little bit of something from this. Um, uh, for, for those of you who are on the call, a survey link will be emailed to you following the program. Uh, we appreciate your feedback. So uh, if you have any feedback, please please provide it because that only helps us for our future programming uh, and, and with, with shaping with that. So um, quick plug for our ACG Pittsburgh uh, holiday party on December 9th from five to eight at the Fairmont. Uh, it's always a good time. Uh, and so I hope to see everyone there. Um, there will be a few uh, groups um, there. So not just ACG, but there'll be plenty of other folks to, to mix and mingle with. So we hope to see you all there. If you have any questions about that, uh, please reach out to someone on Kelly's team, uh, you know, with, with that as well. So uh, with that, uh, again, uh, thank you to the ACG team. Um, congratulations again, Adam uh, and Kim and Nicole. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, if there's any questions anyone has, feel free to reach out to Kim, Nicole, myself, um, anyone, we're happy to answer questions and dive into any further, uh, you know, dive a little bit deeper than we did on the program today. So um, I uh, will give you all back one minute of your afternoon. Um, please take care and thank you. Bye-bye.